Thank you so much for um, that introduction and thank you for all the presentations that have gone before, really talking about uh, the, Ill, uh, the kind of thing that I'll be focusing on today, um, which is to deal with chronic and serious illnesses. So my disclosures are simply that around seven years ago, I was contracted by the Institute for Health System Transformation and Sustainability uh, to start this center uh, and to really use it to promote um, better care for those living with serious illnesses. I have some research funding from the Canadian Frailty Network and no other conflicts. So as many of us know the statistics, um, chronic illness and aging are leading to new problems in terms of the amount of our population, the numbers that will be living with more and more chronic illnesses. And that even though we've looked at lots of different strategies to address some of the specific problems, we know that there is also a high burden of unmet physical, psycho, social, practical, and spiritual needs over time. Laura, Laura, sorry to interrupt, we're not seeing your slides. Do you mind trying to share your screen again? Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so basically, um, at the, at the talking about chronic illnesses, high rates of deaths in hospital, which in most uh, settings are seen as a poor outcome. We also know that because of the topic uh, related to dying, that many of, uh, many of these conversations are not happening in advance. But we know from the literature that if we talk to people who are living with chronic illnesses, many of them have a, a, a threshold in their own minds about when they would no longer want aggressive therapies. But we know that often the alternatives in terms of community-based care have not been discussed or offered to them. Because of the lack of conversations, we also know that at least a third and maybe 50% of the things that we're offering to do for people uh, at the end of life are non-beneficial and often unwanted, and they can even be harmful. We also know what to do. We know that advanced care planning and earlier integration of a palliative approach to care makes a huge difference, both in the quality of life of the patients, but also of their family members, that if we have these conversations in advance, that that causes less burden and stress, and that we set people up for success. We prepare them to live well and also to die well. And in some cases, we've even been shown that conversations may improve survival better than chemotherapy agents and may result in savings for the health system. <clears throat> but we also know that gaps exist. Many of the gaps to do with the fact that there's still stigmas and myths about palliative care, that palliative care reduces hope, or um, that, that is something that we cannot talk about with certain cultures. Many of us have not been trained to have these conversations in a way that feels comfortable and natural. We also often, sometimes feel like we don't have a lot to offer if there's not accessible 24 seven care available in, in our communities. And we know that although there may be good care for cancer patients, that that may not be as true for people with non-cancer diagnoses or those living in rural remote uh, communities or maybe vulnerable, structurally vulnerable for other reasons. So the challenge that was facing me at that time was how, how do we support the changes that we need in our health system and in our society to better deliver person and family centered care for those with serious illnesses. And uh, at that time, I became aware of what had become and what was beginning to be a global movement related to what was being called the public health approach to palliative care or the creation of compassionate communities. And the, and the big idea was a very simple one, that community was an equal partner in the provision of health and social supports at the end of life. And there are key, three key articles I wanna just touch on briefly. The first was by Libby Salno. And I wanna focus particularly on the curve at the bottom right. So many, many of our interventions had been focused on changing uh, the trajectory of illness and the care for people right at the end of life. Earlier referrals, um, more services, better integration, primary care and palliative care specialists and other specialists looking after these patients, but that we weren't really significantly changing things. And what the difference is with a public health approach if we shift to the lower left corner is that by engaging community, 
by engaging often those who've experienced a journey with palliative care or end of life care, either positively or negatively, that those people are often motivated to change care for the next person and the next person they meet. And that overall, we can shift the bell curve to the right by engaging people in our communities to improve care and that that improves things overall. And Libby Salno also did a very simple meta-analysis of the various um, things that had been published to date around the impact of a public health approach. And this is really the core slide. What she found was simple, but profound. That if we do something for another human being motivated by compassion, and that what we do makes a real difference to a real person, then both parties, both the giver and the receiver of the, uh, the compassionate intervention experience individual learning and personal growth. And that that, didn't, that effect, that positive benefit didn't stop with both of the people involved in that interaction, but that, that this had a significant ripple effect and that it would enhance community capacity and over time led to sustainable changes. So compassion, growth, uh, sustainable transformative change. One of the best examples was what a small community in Southwest England did. From is a community of about 30,000 with a catchment area of about 100,000. And they trialed an integrated model of compassionate communities and primary care. The intervention was extremely simple. Family doctors would identify patients who needed enhanced community supports. They would refer them to a health connector. We could do this through accessing pathways or any, any sort of central hub of resources that would link patients in need with potential supports that would be available. But what they did that was unique is they engaged their community by uh, hosting a two hour training for what they called community sign posters. So these were baristas, uh, waitresses, uh, taxi drivers, hairstylists, uh, pastors, leaders of community programs who were trained to point others to resources. So the health connector would reliably and consistently show up at this Tim Hortons on a Monday morning at 10, or that McDonald's at noon, or this uh, place on a Friday. And they would say, why don't you go along on a Monday morning to this site and you'll meet someone who knows how to connect you to resources that can meet the needs that you're having. And where no supports existed, they would help support the initial uh, six months of new groups being formed in community, uh, finding venues, providing money for refreshments. And over time, these uh, networks and groups of support would become self-sustaining in their community. What was not expected was the huge impact that this had on the health system, improved well-being. 29% reduction in emergency room admissions, more home deaths, and a 21% reduction in healthcare costs in their um, area compared to neighboring areas uh, that had not implemented six, these kinds of programs. And so for me, in starting a center, it became obvious what the solution was. We needed to start a center that would promote these significant interactions between the health system and healthcare providers, but also the public and community to work in the white space so that if we're training um, healthcare providers to have serious illness conversations, we're also training family members and community members to know what to ask their providers to stimulate a serious illness conversation and to accelerate the spread of best practices and various innovations. We did that through a very simple seed grants program. We um, initiated a program that would fund any community-based nonprofit organizations with between three and five thousand dollars. We would come alongside to provide coaching, training, and mentoring, and we also provided networking opportunities uh, for recipients of seed grants to talk about what they were doing in their community. And so we would take someone's bright idea or our own idea, and we would help spread it uh, through these uh, through these communities through a uh, through hiring community engage through pr providing community engagement and development. Um, 
provided by specialists, networking and recognition events that would help if, um, spread effective approaches to other communities. In the last five years, we've sponsored over 90 different community initiatives, over half of which were in rural and remote communities that, that have resulted in at least 300 public awareness and education events. We've reached over 6,000 British Columbians. Uh, various communities have developed tools that are then picked up by other communities and implemented there. Uh, we have over 300, uh, now 400 partnerships in local communities throughout British Columbia. And because Dr. Aman Hassan is a public health physician, who's also an epidemiologist, we have evaluation data collected from every uh, project that shows the, be the benefit, the efficacy, the feasibility of spread. Um, just go back here. Sorry. Um, go back, skip my slides here. So what are some of the examples? So uh, in our first round, we trained peers and communities who'd had an end of life experience to train others around advanced care planning public education sessions based on their stories and their experiences to help others avoid negative outcomes. We've spread the use of something called the hello game, uh, bottom left corner, where three or four people get together in a group and there's tokens and there's simple questions that stimulate conversations about the needs of people living with serious illness, grief and end of life experiences that then um, in a randomized controlled trial have been shown to lead to uh, behavior change in terms of advanced care planning and also reaching out to others who are struggling. Uh, Camp Carry is a provincial organization that has um, trialed a whole bunch of innovative approaches to support grief work camps and choirs and walking groups. Um, we have a physician who worked with White Rock Hospice Society to start a legacy project, making jewelry from people who were dying so that others could remember them. And a retired nurse who started a program in Chilliwack based on a program that had been done in Tofino, which basically trained high school students to visit elderly in hospital or in community. Uh, and this was featured on CBC. So, my challenge to you today and my invitation is to be part of the change. All of us are part of local communities. We're part of golf clubs, we're part of churches, we're part of rotary clubs. We can help mobilize compassionate communities where we live to enable others to live well with serious illness, to be aware of the palliative care supports that are available to them, that can support caregivers uh, with long-term care for someone living with dementia, to promote understanding of grief and loss and the tasks of dying well. We've developed these resources um, also not just in English, uh, but in, um, in Mandarin and Chinese and Punjabi uh, to help promote these understandings in some of our communities that approach these issues in different ways than our standard white Caucasian way of approaching them. And so I think that over time, we can recognize that as people living in community, we can make a, a significant difference for those living with serious illness, dying and grief. Um, and if you want more information, all of this is available on our website, uh, our Facebook page, and that, um, and also if you're wanting some ideas, um, the Annals of Palliative Medicine published a whole bunch of um, studies of various different countries that were implementing these initiatives, and then a reference to all the different articles uh, that I've talked about in my talk. So I'm open for questions or discussions. Thanks so much, Doris. Um, I think you already answered one of the questions that came up about a, a resource uh, site. But um, do you have do you have a way to have people access palliative care referrals or resources earlier or faster, or where where they should be referring their patients? So there are palliative care programs now in every community, and um, we're there's been federal funding to integrate palliative care more with some of the community funding that's happening around um, the specialized community programs for complex medical frail adults. So look for how to refer by working with your home care staff and uh, most uh, family physicians in most communities will know how to access these resources. Are some of these on the Pathways program? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. so Pathways might be a good one. Yeah. Terrific. 
Okay. Um, I think those are all the questions we had. One, one of the other questions that came up about is um, how to approach end of life discussions in families where they, the culture is to say, don't tell dad or the parents say, let my kids decide. Yeah. How do you handle those kind of situations? Yeah, so the serious illness conversation is a is a, a you know an evidence based practice, and we've also developed information resources, as mentioned, for Chinese uh, speakers and for Punjabi speakers, and those have been developed. Uh, co-designed with those communities to actually speak specifically into some of those taboos that exist for different cultures. Interesting. Well, thank you very much. This is a challenging area and thanks for all your work that you're doing with that. All right. We're going to